In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. For weeks and weeks, I've been really looking forward to last night. Nicole and I got to go see Stomp at the Orpheum. It's taken me more than 20 years to actually get to see this show. And for those of you who don't know about it, it's this driving, percussive, rhythmic experience that was just fantastic. And I've been so excited that last week, I told a number of people that we were going, and three different people that I told, all three, immediately responded with, oh, that's going to be loud. And I thought, yeah, it's stomp. Of course it's going to be loud. But it got me thinking, wh why would they have said it's going to be loud as if to warn me? My life is loud. <laughs> I have three kids who are my children, and they are loud. My whole life is sort of a whirlwind of sound and loud, and so what's a show at the Orpheum that's loud? It's just another night. But what if we've become too accustomed to loud? What if we've become too familiar with our lives just being loud, with the chaos and the cacophony and the busyness is just the way it is? I think for many of us, we are so used to that that it's hard to stop the noise, to take a pause, and to experience quiet. That noise can be so distracting that it's difficult for us to sit for a time in the quiet. And that's really what we're supposed to be doing in Lent. Experiencing quiet, not for the sake of quiet, but because it's in that quiet where we can actually hear God. How many of us can actually sit there and listen? The distractions of our life keep us from hearing God's voice, and it's those distractions that I want to focus on this second Sunday of Lent. Today's gospel lesson is about distractions. Today's lesson is in the middle of a huge section of parables in the gospel of Luke. Any of you who've ever studied the gospels know that Luke is a great storyteller. If you think about the stories that you know from scripture, I bet Four out of five of them come from Luke. The parables that we love, tell us deep metaphors about life, come from Luke. Jesus, in this portion of Luke's gospel, is getting ready to turn toward Jerusalem, getting ready to move toward his ultimate goal, the passion. And as he finishes up his public ministry, he wants to get as many little lessons in there as possible. So it's one after another after another of these parables, and shoved right in the middle of all of these great parables is this scene, this lament over Jerusalem. Now to put into context, the Pharisees have just shown up in the middle of these teachings of Jesus to warn him that Herod wants him dead. Now, this Herod, in today's gospel lesson, is not Herod the Great, the one that we know from the nativity story who orders the killing of all of the babies when Jesus was born. No, this is not Herod the Great. It is his son, Herod Antipas. But there's a difference here. Herod the Great ruled powerfully. But when he died, his son split up his territory. And Herod Antipas was not as strong, not as powerful. And so the Romans gave him this area to sort of pacify him, but they wouldn't let him use the term king, and they wouldn't let him actually have control. And so Herod Antipas always had this inferiority complex, and so he tried to muscle his way in whenever he could. We know one of the stories where he tried to show off his might when he had John the Baptist killed. And today, the Pharisees are coming to Jesus saying he has become a little too popular, a little too important, and Antipas wants him dead. That would distract most of us. But it does not distract Jesus. Jesus has no time for Antipas, has no fear of him, because he is, he is very certain of his role, of his purpose, of his mission, and nothing is going to sway him from that. The story from today is a display of disappointment, even heartbreak, over 
the people in Jerusalem. Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. Jesus is heartbroken that Jerusalem cannot hear God's call, hear God's invitation to come and be closer to him. Jesus is working on it, trying to make sure everyone hears him, and not even that fox, Antipas, will distract him. Jerusalem is called to repent in this scene. If we take it within the context of all these other parables, Luke places this lament in the middle of a series of parables about repentance, about a turning toward the good and away from the bad. And so I think it's important for us to know those parables in order to better interpret this lament. You see, Jesus is not lamenting over Jerusalem in a judgmental way. He's not passing final judgment on the people of Jerusalem who have not heard God's call. Rather, he is holding out hope for repentance. He's holding out hope that the people of Jerusalem, perhaps of all Israel, will not be passive in the opportunity to respond to God's call. Jesus' words challenge Jerusalem to recognize the divine origin of his mission and to repent and to turn back toward God. This is a call that is something we should hear in 21st century America, too. See, Jerusalem was not listening, but my goodness, we hear even less. Think of all the ways that we are distracted every day. We have constant stimulus around us, whether that's from electronics or anything else. We have this disease of being busy, where we don't feel important or valuable if we're not constantly doing something, being effective, being productive. This busyness keeps us so focused away from God that it's difficult for us to respond, to turn toward the truth that we know in Christ. This sort of awareness and distraction reminds me of a story that happened in Washington, D.C. when I was in seminary years ago. Many of you may know it. But even if you know this story, I want you to listen in particular so that you can see just what is missed just what is unheard. In Washington, D.C., on a cold January morning in 20, 2007, Joshua Bell showed up to a D.C. metro station. Joshua Bell, perhaps one of the greatest violinists ever. And in that metro station, as people were passing by to and fro, going to work, very busy, he unpacked his instrument and began to play a series of six pieces by Bach, some of the most intricate, beautiful pieces ever written for the violin. After about three minutes of playing, a middle-aged man seemed to notice that there was music in the station. He slowed his pace and stopped for just a moment and then hurried on to meet his schedule. About four minutes in, Joshua received his first dollar, dropped in a hat by a woman who didn't even turn and look at him, just kept on going. Six minutes later, a young man leaned against a wall to listen for a moment and then glanced at his watch and knew obviously he needed to keep moving and so left in a hurry. Ten minutes later, a three-year-old boy stopped, but his mother tugged at his arm and pulled him along. The kid stopped again and looked back at Joshua, but the mother pushed him again to keep him moving on his way. This action, a child stopping and looking, happened over and over again, and without exception, the parent pushed and pulled the child along to keep them on schedule. After 45 minutes of playing, only six people had stopped for any short period of time to listen to Joshua play. And after an hour, he finished the station silent again. No one noticed, no one applauded, no recognition at all. He had collected $32. This musician, who had just the night before sold out a concert hall 
where the average ticket was over $100, playing a violin worth three and a half million dollars. No one noticed. How busy are we that we cannot hear or see or notice the beauty all around us? The good news today is that Jesus says with the Holy Spirit that when the Spirit is poured forth from him to us, a new community emerges, a big tent put over the whole of humanity, all of the diversity that we have in this human community is made new in Christ. If we have the courage and the will to focus, to hear God, to listen to God, we become bearers of that truth, prophets of that message to a world who has such trouble listening. When we listen and receive and act on God's message, we are changed, and we bring about God's kingdom on earth. Yesterday, I watched for a little bit Justice Anthony and Scalia's funeral. I bet many of you saw portions of it too. Justice Scalia's funeral was presided over by his son, Paul, who's a Roman Catholic priest. And Paul preached the sermon at his funeral. And a funeral, just like Lent, is an invitation to a moment where we can sit and reflect on our mortality and the hopefulness that we have in Christ that this life is not all that there is. And so I want to close with a quote from Paul's sermon. Paul said, Every funeral reminds us of just how thin the veil is between this world and the next, between time and eternity, between the opportunity for conversion and the moment of judgment. So we cannot depart here unchanged. So I say to you, as we continue this journey of Lent, every moment we sense the presence of God reminds us just how thin the veil is between this world and the next. Every time we come together and worship God to pray for one another and with one another and to seek ways to live better tomorrow how we live today, and every time we join together in common mission and ministry, we cannot help but be left changed. Life is a journey of change. Every moment, every day, we may continue to do what we do so that when we change, we are confident that we move closer and closer to Christ. Amen.